Okay, well, I'll, I'll get right onto it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out by, I've left, I put a message in the chat to the website link, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll go straight into sharing the screen because I'd like to walk you through the, the website and what we're doing and everything that's involved in it. All right, so this is, a, is really a project about climate change and, and climate change adaptation and mitigation. Now, we've got a dual problem with climate change. First of all, we're pumping excessive greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and that's changing the climate. And I think most of us on this session would know that. But there may be some things you're not really sure about. The second thing we're doing, and it's quite often overlooked, is we're destroying biodiversity and we're destroying our critical life support mechanisms with that, including a stable climate. So, so it's a really, it's a dual linked problem. It's not a singular problem. So, and this is where my keyboard decides it's not gonna work, oh, there we are. So the world's plan so far, and it's changing all the time, but just so far, is to keep emitting greenhouse gases as fast as human until 2050, and we can let New Zealand's agriculture keep emitting them all the way through, even past 2050. Uh, and taxpayers will pick up any slack in the emissions trading scheme. Great plan. That's part one. Part two is to pull CO2 from the atmosphere using what are called yet to be invented tech and store it somewhere and hope it doesn't leak. Now, some of that tech has been invented and I've actually been and seen it. Some of it's in Squamish, Canada, where they're bottling CO2 and reselling it as fuel. And that's funded by the tar sands in Canada. Great tech. Another tech is in um, Helsinki, just north of Reykjavik in Iceland, and they're doing an amazing job of storing gas underground, CO2, but they're doing it in thimble-sized amounts. So the only rocks available to do that around the world are quite limited. So basically, we've still got to invent the tech and deploy it fast enough to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. So the third plan, part of the world's plan, is we're going to have to adapt really fast because of plan one and eight, one and two, and because irreversible climate tipping points not factored into the Paris Accord are already being exceeded. And by that, I mean the Paris Accord only factors into human emissions and the changes to the climate that human emissions will cause will cause. It doesn't factor in those emissions that human activities like uh, which are changing the climate, uh, which are producing lots of methane, say, out of melting permafrost and all the forest fires, it doesn't factor in any of that. And it doesn't factor it in because it doesn't know how much that's going to happen or how bad that's going to be. So we haven't accounted for any of that under the Paris Accord. So the smart response, you would think, would be to rapidly reduce emissions. Well, we're trying to do that in lots of different ways, but nature doesn't tend to get a look in on that regard. So our project is to look at how we can use nature. And the idea there is to map, uh, mobilize free ecosystem services provided by nature to pull CO2 from the atmosphere and store it naturally in trees, in forests, in wetlands, in peat soils, in any soils really, that stores CO2 naturally and it holds onto it and it builds it up. By the way, restoring biodiversity also helps clean our waterways, replenishes biodiversity, replenishes Mahinga Kai and helps us adapt to irreversible climate changes, including things like sea level rise, which we'll talk about a little bit in a minute. So here we go. Now we know this is going to work because climate and nature work perfectly well before we broke them. So I put this slide in and I meant to take it out again before I submitted this because it's actually out of date. And it's out of date because if you look at where we are, that's pretty much accurate. But the current warming trajectory, that's kind of accurate. The warming under the Paris Accord, that red writing on the, on the right just below that, that actually needs to go up above warming under the Paris Accord. The UN has now officially recognized that if we meet our obligations under the Paris Accord, we are going to exceed three degrees. So we really kind of shot ourselves a foot in the foot there. But I kept it in because what I have included is if we use nature-based solutions, regardless of how bad things get, that's going to help reduce the impact quite a bit. And this is actually from a paper in Nature that was published in 2018. So it's all peer-reviewed research. We're not just putting these graphs up because they're pretty. Right. So getting to the main point of this presentation, which is, I'm just keeping an eye on my time. 
uh, which is about the website that we're developing. And the website is two parts, essentially. One part is the climate wiki. So if you look at that at the top, you've got the nuts and bolts of climate change in the menu. And then the second menu is nature-based solutions. So each of those menus have their own submenus, and each of those submenus delve much deeper into different aspects of it. The first thing I'm going to look at is go over here to the nature-based solutions and hopefully get my, here we are, my mouse has decided it doesn't like working. We're just going to flick into one of them. And there's about 100 pages there, but the purpose of this presentation is just to introduce you to the site, what's on the site, and how we want you to be able to contribute to the site so we can all share these resources. So when ecosystems, we explain how ecosystems are climate superheroes. We explain the problems and also the solutions. And again, this is all based on either published period research or it's under government documents or it's information we know or strategic statements. Okay, there's nothing sort of fuzzy in it. It's real hard science. And then, I'll just flip down now, so you'll see how the, the menu structure works. We've gone from our ecosystems and there's a whole list of ecosystems under that menu structure. So we flip down to our places, which is the next slide. And this is an example of several places. Now this menu under our places, that green background menu at the bottom there, that's changing all the time because we're continuously adding more pages to it. But I just wanted to show you the structure of it. So the whole idea of the website under our places is it's, it's a story. It's who's doing, what they're doing, where they're doing it. And this particular example, it's Akaroa Area School who are restoring a, a reserve. And if you scroll down the page, which we can't do because we're on 10 slides, and, but I can scroll to the next page, this is what you'll see. And it's the why and how. So what they've done, why they've done it, and how what they're doing actually helps mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change. We tend to have to write that section for people because there's still a disconnect between what you're doing and oh, lots of conservation, but how does it help climate change? We can write those bits, that's okay. And we don't publish the page until everybody's comfortable with the content. So we'll scroll down a bit further on that page. Whoop. And you can see there's more information available. And what's really, really important, the resources and contacts. So we can share what other people are doing. We can share it with one another. And you keep scrolling down. There's lots of references and further reading. This is particularly true when it comes to the climate wiki. So I'm just going to jump quickly over to Turutara Coastal Park, which also has a, a page up there. I won't go through the whole thing because we've only got two slides left. Um, but what we do is we describe it. So we're sharing the story, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And we can help write. You don't have to be a great writer to do this. So the park is positioned literally between the Waimakariri River and the Ashley Rakahui River. Its focus is on restoring the wetland and restoring native biodiversity, but they're also taking climate change into consideration, which includes sea level rise. So if you scroll down the page, what you see is this is what's going to happen with sea level rise. And this is some of this is locked in. For example, this, the first one on the left, that's a locked in change. And you can see it's pretty hard to see on the screen, but on the website, you can click on it and blow it up and see yourselves. Where if you're living in Kaipoi, you'll have, you know, <laughs> coastal frontage pretty soon. Um, but you look at that and think, oh, hang on a minute, I don't understand sea level rise. So obviously throughout the entire site, and you can see it was any site. Everything that's hot linked is in blue. You can click on a hot link and that takes you back over to the section under the nuts and bolts of climate change. That's the climate wiki. And that explains rising sea levels. It includes all the evidence from Niwa, from Canterbury, um, from ECAN, everybody. And you can get a feeling for what's going on. So I'm hoping you all sort of understand the concept of the site and I'm hoping that we want you will share your conservation stories with us so we can add them under the section on our places. Um, just a final thought before I finish, um, is a quote from Jocelyn Timberley, who's a climate journalist. And she said, we can use our action to drive our own hope rather than leaving it to someone else to do it for us. Once we focus on what we can change, it's amazing how many things we can actually do. Thank you for listening. Over to you, Bruce. Tony, there was a question from Pete from the CCC. I presume that this Christchurch City Council. Uh, where did you source 
the sea level rise projection maps. I've just put the link on that. It's under the Tuatara Coastal Park page on the website. And off the top of my head, there's probably 25 references there. And off the top of my head, I, yeah, I'd have to, it is actually linked to it. It's a fairly recent report. It was commissioned by the Waimakariri District Council. You've got my email. So if whoever asked that, can they email me and I can dig up the exact link. It's just that I can't spot it off the top of my head on the top of, on the on the references there. Any more questions in the room? Um, I think I have a question. I'm Sarah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we got you, Sarah. Awesome. Uh, I first, wanted to thank both Reese and Sunny. Excellent presentations and thank you for your email addresses because uh, I would like to get involved more in these projects and I'm just wondering um, what either of you would recommend for that like how to get involved more um I as quickly recent uh, have a look at the website go on to our places to see what other people are doing and if you're involved in conservation projects let me know and we will try to to, to add them to that page or to those list of pages. Reese, over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. I think we have time for uh, one more question. John. Uh, yes, if I could just make a, a comment. Um, this is the first time I've seen any information about Braid. Um, and it seems that this is a really excellent initiative. Um, clearly, nature is the biggest and best ally we have. Nature has sustained life on Earth for four billion years and recycles everything. New Zealand used to be 80% covered by native forest and is now only 20% covered. And I think globally as well, our only chance is to work with nature. And Sonny, I'm very glad that you pointed out the issue of tipping points because this is a, a frightening scenario that we're facing. So it's just that comment. It's excellent work. And I will pass on your link to a lot of people who I know may be interested in this. And I really encourage you to, um, to make linkages um, and, and, and advertise what you're doing because it's very important work. Thank you. Um, I've just actually added the link to the Jacobs Waimakariri District Crown Review Natural Hazards Report where those images came from. Uh, and please share, the, this is largely a voluntary project, so I have to sort of, it is funded a little bit by ECAM, but I have to keep putting my own time into it. So um, yeah. more on people I can get involved in doing things, the better. Well, that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you very much, everybody.